It sounds like it. Yeah. <clears throat> you guys let me know when we're live and sure. I Oh, now we can start. Sheriff Nelson's here. Now we can. Now it's a party. You're, li you're live. He said we're live. I know we're live. We're okay. live? We're live. Okay, we're live. <laughs> <laughs> now we can start, I guess. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll call our Metro Management Council meeting to order. It's our December 15, 2021 meeting. Uh, we do have a quorum with uh, four of us. Uh, Councillor Erickson is absent today, so... We'll get started with our first order of business item one, which is to approve our agenda, which is in front of you all. So just need a motion to approve that, please. I moved. Second. All right. Motion by Karski, second by Benninga. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That passes. Uh, item two, public input. Anyone here for public input today? All right. Hearing none there, we're going to move to item three. It's our minutes from our last meeting, which was back in August. Uh, those have been provided to you all for review, and if there are no changes, I need a motion there to approve those. Move to approve. Second. All right. Motion by Kylie and seconded by Karski on that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> all right. Minutes are approved. Move to item four, our direct report from Scott. Scott, good afternoon, man. All right. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. We have a, kind of a marathon agenda today to work through, so I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, first item is kind of a staffing report for you. Uh, Metro has experienced improved retention of staff, uh, having received only two resignations of full-time <clears throat> non-probationary staff this year. Um, one of those operators has returned to us in a temporary status, so um, we really appreciate him coming back into our agency to, to provide uh, some additional hours. In 2021, uh, two operators completed the 26-week training program that we have. Uh, there are three that are currently in training and five that did not complete the training. I think that's uh, an indication of how complex and uh, difficult the work is, is that in some cases, as we go through our training phases, um, operators decide that uh, it's more, than, more overwhelming than what they expected. So um, that does sometimes happen in our environment. Uh, currently, Metro has three vacant operator positions. Um, we're intending to fill two of those on December 27th with a, a new recruit class that we have starting. So uh, recruitment has remained strong throughout the year for us. We have seen increased interest from applicants residing, residing outside of South Dakota. Um, this year was our first year of continuous application process, which has given us, uh, it's been successful for our agency to do that. It's given us some flexibility both for the candidates, especially uh, folks that are applying from outside of the state, and it's given us more flexibility as a leadership team to coordinate all the resources that go into the application process. So um, I'm going to give credit to the, Anna on that because that was her idea to move to a continuous hiring process and it's worked out well for us. Uh, the second item is, is an update uh, pertaining to the 9-1 profession. Um, like many professions, there are staffing shortages across the nation. There uh, is some difficulty recruiting operators across the nation. And uh, what we're finding is that uh, through professional 911 publications, that many of the larger public safety answering points are struggling to, to find those operators. And they're, they're operating at 30 to 40 percent vacancy rates, um, which makes it really difficult when you're in the emergency communications business. Uh, this trend right now appears to be occurring outside of the borders of the Midwest region. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, East Coast, West Coast, uh, to the south of us, and even into Canada, where they're struggling to fill operator positions. But right now, here in the Midwest, um, we're still having a very successful um, <coughs> time of, of, of uh, recruiting new, ap uh, new operators. So uh, strategies that have been... Uh, implemented so far are hiring bonuses to try and attract staff, uh, significant salary increases. Um, but so far, none of those things have proven to be very effective for those organizations that are struggling to recruit. Um, we believe that uh, what it's really about, at least here at Metro Communications, is uh, workload and responsibility of 911 operators to make sure that we're keeping a, a close eye on uh, any additional activities that we require our officers to do. 
um, you know, being uh, ahead of staffing shortages to make sure that uh, we're not overloading our staff. And, uh, you know, just being vigilant and intentional in our hiring process to make sure that we're hiring the right individuals that are looking for a long-term career. Um, so, so far that's been successful for us. Yes, Commissioner. <coughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, do you guys do exit interviews not only for the ones who leave that are employed, but also the ones that are in training that don't finish? Yes, we do. Uh, that's part of honest job with uh, our HR is to do exit interviews and and uh, you know try and determine the reasons why people uh, would leave the agency. And of course, we're always open for opinion from our operators that are staying in the agency to give us feedback. So, can you summarize that kind of at some point in the future about what your experience has been? Sure. Sorry. Great question. So move into the third item of the uh, my report, which is to introduce you to the 911 Saves Act. Um, U.S. representatives from California and Pennsylvania have reintroduced the 911 Saves Act in April of this year. Um, what that stands for is it's the Supporting Accurate Views of Emergency Services. Uh, it's an act that legislates uh, Legislation is seeking to classify 911 operators from office and administrative support to instead protective service occup occupations in the Office of Management and Budget Standard and Occupational Classification. So essentially um, classifying them as um, public safety individuals. The act is supported by the Association of Public Safety Communication Officers, um, which is APCO, and then also the NINA um, group, which is the National Emergency Number Association and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Uh, the 911 Saves Act passed the House of Representatives as part of the Fiscal 2022 National Defense Authorization Act, and uh, the 911 Saves Act was first introduced to Congress in 2019. Um, the reclassification of operators has been a trend that is gaining support from local, state, and uh, other government entities. Uh, the reclassification of 911 operators affords them the same public safety recognition and benefits as other public safety or uh, protective service occupations. So um, for our staff uh, here, I know that uh, I've been involved in a few different conversations, and uh, really what it relates to is, is just that recognition of being at the tip of the spear, as we always say, in public safety. And um, uh, I think uh, you know that's something that uh, our staff uh, will be involved with as this process moves forward uh, in this state. Um, I, I expect that this trend will continue to move across the nation and, and at some point in time, perhaps our legislators will uh, you know, have to uh, look at that as something to um, you know, pass through legislation. So, any questions on that at all? Okay. Oh, Scott, yes, a follow up. I mean, what would that take here to get um, your personnel classified in that way? Does that have to be a legislative action? Well, what's currently being proposed by Nina and APCO is they're advising uh, PSAPs, emergency communication centers across the nation to start uh, looking at revising job descriptions. Um, so that includes some of those things that are related to public safety um, positions. Um, and then of course, uh, Generally, what that uh, will lead to is in, in each state is the retirement system. Uh, it's a different class of retirement from a class A to a class B. Um, so that would have to be looked at as well. Okay. I, I will when I talk, yeah. Okay, um, we'll go to item number four. Uh, in 2019, Metro established a retention committee to explore retention strategies amongst our staff. One of the ideas that uh, came from that group was to explore the implementation of a 12-hour shift and a 36-hour work week. Um, the purpose of this 12-hour shift is to promote a life-work balance by having more days off to provide an additional rest period between uh, uh, you know, their days off and, and coming back to work. Uh, a recent survey of our staff indicated that we had 20 operators that were in favor of a 12-hour shift we had 17 that were opposed, and we had seven that were indifferent. Um, some of that opposition 
uh, was not necessarily to the 12 hour shifts, but instead they needed more information about how it might impact scheduling and, and other things in the organization. Uh, in order to maintain that same level of coverage, four additional operators would need to be hired, but our financial goal is to defray uh, much of that cost of the additional operators through reduced hours due to the 36 hour work week. Um, so our current staff that would go to a 36 hour work week um, some would be on a 36 hour, some would be on a 40 hour. Um, that, that savings, if you will, or that reduced amount of work week uh, would be what we'd look to hire the additional operators so that we could have the same level of coverage. Our staffing goal is to create greater work-life balance and minimize uh, the recruitment and training costs because it's extremely expensive for us, as I indicated earlier, when you have five people that are working their way through a 26-week training program and uh, at some point during that training, they, uh, they choose to leave the agency. So we're trying to retain instead of uh, recruit. So the next item on my list is the uh, International Academies of Emergency Dispatch provides emergency medical dispatch protocols to more than 3,600 centers uh, worldwide with approximately 300 agencies obtaining the elite title of being identified as an accredited center of excellence, or ACE. Metro is one of those 300 organizations across the world that uh, has that elite title. And we have had that title for almost 20 years. Um, Metro began its three-year accreditation process this fall. And upon submitting all the necessary information and and other things that our case reviewer needed. Uh, it was discovered that Metro needed to make some adjustments in our call taking in order to retain our ACE certification. Metro has already provided a 30 minute training with all staff and an additional training uh, just occurred in our in our in-service uh, a week or so ago. Metro is continuing to work with the ACE board to complete our reaccreditation re process. Um, this falls uh, under the responsibility of our quality assurance coordinator, Justin Faber, who's present today, um, if you would have any questions for him. What I would say is that Metro operators are doing an excellent job right now in providing emergency medical dispatch service. Our performance, uh, based upon the 25 calls that we submitted to the ACE accreditation agency, uh, they said that uh, there were zero chief complaint errors, zero pre-arrival instruction errors, zero final coding errors, zero diagnostic errors, and zero <coughs> protolink uh, errors. Um, the adjustments that we need to make are all script standards. So in other words, um, they're requiring us to read the protocols word for word versus interjecting words that might uh, um, sound more personable or friendly or softer. Uh, it is common for experienced ACE agencies like Metro to make slight deviation from script in order to become less robotic uh, and more personable in the call taking process. While these deviations uh, don't present a legal challenge in most cases, any deviation from the protocol as they are written has the potential risk for error in questioning. Um, we're currently working with the IAD, the uh, International Academy Emergency Dispatch to provide an on-site training course to help alleviate staff concerns related to protocol script. Um, again, if you have any questions, Justin's here today. He's continuing to work through this process. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, the ACE accreditation piece is um, it's a long um, accomplishment in our agency and we'd, we'd uh, like to try and continue to maintain that, that status and be one of the lead organizations. What's, what's the primary benefit of having the accreditation? Do we get reimbursements or something, or is it just a seal of approval type thing? Type deal? Right, so we actually, I believe, pay to be accredited an accredited agency. Um, th the benefit is, is that to be ACE certified, we have to send our calls for evaluation into um, the ACE group to review. Uh, if you're not accredited, you don't do that process. You evaluate in-house, and then you have that opportunity to maybe deviate from script in some way that fits your agency. But by sending them in to, to be scored by um, the ACE group, 
that holds us to the standard of following protocols per script and along with a lot of other policies that, uh, that are in play. So it's really um, a, a tool to make sure that we're following the EMD protocols with the T's uh, crossed and the I's dotted. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Does it assist in, for instance, grant applications and things of that nature to have that certification? Well, I would certainly think it would help. Uh, you know, anytime you're applying for grant funds, the, the more accomplishments that you can show, um, you know, the better luck you'll have with the process. But, um, you know, in, and like I said, there's only 300 of these uh, across the world. So some of those are hospital type systems. Some of those are ambulance type systems, and then some are emergency communication centers. So, um, when you when you divide it like that, there's probably only you know 100 PSAPs across the world that uh, that have this certification. So, but it is uh, a challenge at time for our staff. Um, I've heard a lot of feedback um, that uh, it does in some regard, take away their ability to deviate from the script and, and they have to follow the, the script word for word. Okay, uh, move on to the next thing, which is uh, we deployed six tablet computers in 2015 to support our operations. Uh, these tablets have become obsolete. Some are not even functioning anymore. Uh, we had a couple of opportunities for grant funding. So we submitted a grant to the Sioux Falls Department of Health as well as the State 91 Coordination Board. And uh, we've recently been informed that we have received funding to purchase 10 new tablet computers. So as a matter of fact, we already have received two of those. So those will help us in our operations. They'll provide better flexibility for the leadership staff to, um, to leave their office environment and to be on the floor uh, and have access to all the information that they need to to make uh, to make decisions so and our ACOs will also use these in the training environment um, sometimes all of our councils are being operated so the only tool that the ACO has available is to have this tablet to see what the recruit is doing without hovering over the recruit so all right the next item on the list is the 91 coordination board funding assistance you may recall that uh, we received an allocation of $1,046,138.61. Um, I've highlighted some things in yellow within this table. Those are items that have already been purchased uh, from the $1 million. The things that uh, are not highlighted, we intend to begin working on in either 2022 or 2023. But I just wanted to bring your attention to um, that list and I'll continue to update this list as we um, proceed into our future council meetings. Some statistical information that I wanted to provide. Uh, overall, 911 calls are up 4.9%. This is about double what our expected annual growth is um, for 911 calls. Administrative calls are up 3.35%. This is above our expected annual growth of 2.25%. Calls for service, um, where we're sending either you know, ambulance, uh, law enforcement, or fire services, those calls for service are up 3.2%. Uh, above normal, but has become more stable over the last four to five months. This next piece is, is something that uh, I think we should be really proud of as an agency, and that is that 911 call answer times in November 90.89% of the time we answered those calls in under 10 seconds. 97.75% under 15 seconds we answered that call for service, or that telephone call. 99.03% under 20 seconds we answered that 911 call. Um, the reason why I think we should be proud of that is right now reading uh, national publications, I'm seeing some places across the nation that uh, call times are much, much, much longer than uh, seconds. We're talking minutes uh, in some locations. So it's, uh, it's something that I think we should be very proud of as a community to know that when you call, that 911 call is gonna be answered in less than 20 seconds. <clears throat> if I could, Mayor, go ahead. Uh, first of all, yes, great times. Of course, if you're in an emergency and you're sitting there, seconds can seem like minutes. Right. But yeah, I'm just curious, Scott, why we would um, 
have such a low expected annual growth rate? Why wouldn't our growth rate kind of track with our population growth rate? <coughs> has typically been averaging 4 or 5%. Sure. So, you, you know, it, it depends on a lot of different things, but calls for service, um, you know, will always, appears to always kind of follow what your population growth are, but there's so many factors that can change that. Um, you know, sometimes it's the size of the community, sometimes it's uh, other aspects of public safety, sometimes it's, uh, um, you know, there's just a long list of things, uh, social services, all those things that, that can become involved that, that change um, how many calls for service a community will have. Um, in our estimate here, um, this is an estimate that Justin Faber has used in the past to try and gauge what our growth will be so we can plan for staffing. Um, so it's, it's, it's strictly a number that has been related to the past. And so is, is this use an, an anomaly then? I mean, has it been historically two and a half percent and this year it's just at four? Sure. So this is a, a one-off then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, is anything probably related to how stagnant 2020 was with COVID? So okay. That, just that might be that there could be a, a double growth year for us because we kind of knew the population still grew in 2020 when our call for service numbers didn't because of COVID. So okay. I'd say it was expected, but still it hits home when you're seeing that double year. Thank you. Yep. Any other any other questions on Scott's report here? So just the last page to quickly go over here. Sorry, we got. Um, I didn't see that. So the top chart is phone calls in and out of our center. Um, you'll notice that PD East, PD West, Minneapolis County Sheriff's Office, data, and and even the City Fire Council, our call volume on those uh, particular councils are, are decreasing. And that's, uh, that's something that we've been working on as an agency is to not have an operator that's responsible for radio traffic to also be responsible for telephone traffic. So these are all trending in the right direction. Um, you'll notice that the county fire, there are more calls being answered there as well as the call taker positions. You may recall a year or so ago when we asked for the four positions, that was one thing we wanted to do is create call taker positions so that we could um, have less calls being answered by these other boards. So we're headed in the right direction. Um, I will say that there are some deviations to this because of the fact that we have moved uh, duties around between councils due to COVID and some other um, some other aspects of our business, but uh, for the most part, I, I do believe that these trends are going in the right direction at all of, the, all of these boards. So the bottom board uh, is an indication of our calls for service as well as radio transmits. On the left side of the, of the chart is the calls for service. On the right side is the transmits. Uh, you'll see down the left side, it's pretty steady across the board for police, fire, and EMS uh, calls for service. Um, on the right side, uh, same thing, you'll see that uh, under the police, you know, we're at the um, three plus million push to talks <coughs> annually. And uh, we believe that that is uh, a bit of an indication that that number likely won't be able to rise because we are at what's called agency occupancy, meaning that the staff that are at those boards are doing all that they can already so they can't do more. So that why that, that's why that number appears to have leveled off is because they're already as busy as they can be. So. And that, Mayor, is uh, the end of the director's report. All right, thanks, Scott. Any other questions for Scott on his report there? All right, we'll move on to item five, our 2022 meeting schedule, uh, draft schedule. It's at the bottom of the agenda there, uh, what's being proposed. Uh, unless there's any conflicts, anybody knows off the top of her head, we'll just roll with that. Yep. It's all good. I don't think we need a formal action on that, but that will be our 2022 schedule. Uh, I'm gonna miss the August and December ones. Yeah, you're you're terming out, man. We got <laughs> got one more with you. You uh, can two go. more. We got two more with you. Yeah, you, you can two still more. go. Yeah. Yeah, I could. And yeah. We, and we get an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah um that's a great point though in we will lose both counselor erickson and counselor kylie next year off this council because they're both termed out as counselors so 
there will be new uh, assignments to this uh, council mid-year um, per our bylaws. So uh, item six, approval of eight hours of administrative pay for December 24, 2021. Sure. In previous years, the Metro Management Council approved eight hours administrative pay for Christmas Eve. Um, in the past, it's been a practice that's been similar to other local governments. Um, Metro Communications Bargaining Agreement and Personnel Manual recognizes December 25th, Christmas Day, as a paid holiday, but not Christmas Eve. Um, I, I'm submitting this uh, for your consideration, and I, I understand that uh, there may or may not be some differences with the holiday landing on a on a weekend this this time around. So, what's open. what's the historical context on that? How do we do this in the past? Typically, in the past, um, the Metro Management Council has approved, uh, at least in the recent years. Um, but my understanding is that you know the county may or may not uh, be approving uh, some type of. Uh, uh, Christmas Eve or uh, administrative pay this year. City, I'm, I'm not sure you know what the consideration there is either. So I I thought that we'd bring it today yeah. and uh, let you folks you know um, have some conversation about what's going on at the city and county level. And if this is something you'd want to support, we appreciate it. If uh, not, we understand. Yeah. I could, Mayor. The um, the county is taking Christmas day, um, day is a Saturday, so Friday is going to be the holiday, and we have no plans to add any additional um, pay for sure. the county level. So, And I, I think doing this, and I hate to be the bad guy, but I'll, I'll say it, I mean, would just create disparity between levels of government. I don't know what the state is doing. I don't know what your intents are, but at the county level. Well, we did give an administrative day for the 23rd, so... Mm -hmm. Scrooge McDuck over here, we, we, <laughs> we did do that. So, so it's really, you know, my, and my approach in, in proving that was there's so few, few tools or mechanisms we have like this to do something for our team. Okay, we can't bonus some year end bonus, like private. So I do have that power via executive order for the city. So I'm like, well, if this is something I, one of the tools I can use, we did it. So I, I'm more inclined to uh, issue this than not. Um, and we've done it every year I've been the mayor. So that's why the precedent, you see, to your point, precedent, we set the press on the other side. So it'd be hard for me to swing it back. Um, you have press on the county side. So I don't know if you, you guys I, have I, any thoughts. I would agree. I mean, Christmas Eve, whether it's falling on a weekend or the middle of the, middle of the week, it, to me, it doesn't make any difference. And I think it is just a, a small gesture that we can make to our staff that serve in such important roles. So I personally am in favor of this. You don't know what the state's doing at this point? I am not aware of what the state is intending to do. I'm going to guess with this, the governor's been pretty generous with this time, type of leave also. And, and the county has given, on, if Christmas Eve was a, you know, a Thursday or, right. or whatever, we would give half a day. I mean, so, um, right. and the decision hasn't been made as a final for the county either. But mm -hmm. I can guess the state's going to be doing something soon. Yeah. Well, we won't tell anybody, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can we can vote on it, and if uh, if it's if it's two two, it doesn't it doesn't pass. Uh, so, um, are you guys all right with us just voting on this? Do we have any more discussion? I can see where it puts you guys in an interesting spot it because does. of the position you yeah, took with the does. county versus this. So, um, well, the interesting part is is that most of our departments are connected to the state with some regularity, uh, almost like a satellite location. Sure. Um, so it would be nice to know what the state was doing, but do you know, Sheriff? Tell you what, how about we, let's defer this item. Let's, okay. let's see what the state's doing, and we can, take a, we can take a vote over email. We can send this out sure. to the council via an email and vote that you know, way. Right. If Is the state's right? doing it, I would be in favor of doing it also. Are we able to do yeah. that? It's not, wouldn't be a public, Can we? wouldn't be a public meeting. Can, may I? I'm, look, I'm trying to look it up right now. All right, well, let, let's I, maybe circle I back. Make a motion. I, I guess I propose a motion that 
we give you the authority as the chair of this commission to follow what the state does. Okay. We can do that. Yeah, can we do that? We can, we can vote on that. Whatever the state's doing, we will follow as Metro. Okay. All right, so that's the motion. We got a second for that? Second. Okay. I think that's a good solution. If it's in a hurry, well, they can do it right now. Well, I'm, will you retract well, the Scrooge? We could, we could, we <laughs> could re retract the Scrooge <laughs> statement. Yeah, strike that from the minutes, though. We, <laughs> Ooh, that must have stung just a tiny bit. <laughs> yeah, a little. We yeah, can but, always reconsider uh, yeah. if at, by the end of the meeting, if we come up yep. with, uh, with an answer prior to the end of the meeting. Yeah. All right. Again, certainly appreciated what, whatever direction we go. Um, we just wanted to bring it to you for consideration. Okay, well, let's, let's vote on the motion. To, we're going to align uh, our action with whatever the state is doing on this right. item. That's the motion, the second. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We'll do that. We'll maybe know by the end of the meeting. Uh, item 7, approval of resolution 21-02, employee benefits. Okay, Metro Communications Agency provides various benefits to our staff through contracted vendors. Uh, our staff have the opportunity to receive EAP resources through the First Responder Assistance Program, known as FRAP, uh, a new EAP program that's designed specifically for first responders and their families, and it's provided through the South Dakota Municipal League Workers' Compensation Fund, which is our insurance carrier. Uh, I'm requesting Metro Management Council to adopt Resolution 21-02, recognizing the addition of the FRAP as an additional EAP program for our staff and their families. All right. Got any questions on that one, Dean? Go. Scott, I know Ona's been doing a lot of your HR work. Do you have an HR resource available to you? Uh, Anna certainly works with the city and the county um, as needed, um, if there is assistance needed, but Anna is really a one-person um, uh, resource in our agency that handles all financial and HR duties. She's done a great job up to this point, but there are times, and I've come to understand this greater and greater in my time in office, how, how much to appreciate a, an HR full-time dedicated, and, and obviously you don't need that, but um, you know, I look at the volume of things we're going to be talking about, administrative pay, employee benefits, um, non-bargaining unit pay, and so on and so forth, that to have, I mean, there's, there are companies that, you know, do HR consulting work, and I don't know if that's, if you're at that point where you should be considering a contract for that type of work. City of Brandon does that, you know, they don't have an HR, full-time HR department, but they do contract out their HR work. Um, Anna and I have spoke on many occasions about how critical the work is that she does for our agency, and uh, man, we just we couldn't we couldn't run our business without the support that Anna provides, and and uh, she is very much appreciated in our agency. And as a matter of fact, coming up here, uh, we're going to request that uh, a business support specialist to try and lighten her lo workload a little bit so that we can. Um, and no, and I'm not trying focus. to replace her. I'm trying to give her the help. Right. That, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So take it for what it's worth. I guess. I think that the the point being because I I agree sometimes that's supplemented via staff. We'll talk about that sometimes. A vendor is maybe a good route to go because there's continuity in that. As well, it's not depending on if someone leaves, goes, sure. and all that knowledge leaves. We got a partner. So I think that's what what. Commissioner Karski is getting in. I think it's a good point, and we'll probably talk about that more in um, its upcoming item. So, on this item, do we? Uh, is there uh, a motion to approve, to approve this? I would second that. All right, motion to approve by Karski, seconded by Benninga. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. All right, we'll move to item eight, resolution twenty-one zero three, non-bargaining unit pay. Sure. The bargaining unit of Metro Communications approved it to enter into a three-year labor agreement with Metro Communications on December 9, 2020. This agreement stipulates a 1.75% cost of living adjustment for the year 2022. Um, this request is for salaried staff to receive the same 1.75% COLA in order to prevent uh, compression between the various employment positions at Metro Communications. 
In addition, this resolution establishes the pay grades and scales for the new positions of uh, full-time division supervisor and part-time business support specialists. And I just respectfully request your approval of resolution 21-02. All right. Uh, questions on this one? I don't have a question, but I will tell you that I think we have all experienced across whatever business we're in or public relationships that cost of living is above 1.75. Yeah. Significantly. Yeah. What this, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. What is it 1% pay raise equal to for an annual? About $35,000 in our, in our organization mm, okay. for 1%. Do you have room in your budget for 275? Uh, we do have um, another agenda item coming up <laughs> towards the end that uh, involves some negotiation of wages. Okay. I guess the other question I have, because I don't know the answer, obviously, is how much flexibility do we have with a union contract? Very little, typically. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, very little. If there's going to be any adjustment to that COLA number, you have to reopen the contract, reopen the negotiations. So, and then that's reopening all the negotiations. So everything's back on the floor. So, yeah. Okay. Um, well, do we want to get a motion to approve this item? Move to approve. Second. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Karski to approve uh, item eight. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, item nine, adoption of personnel manual revisions, article four, section 4.18 holidays, article five, section 5.01 drug and alcohol free workplace plan, and article seven, section 7.01 group health and dental insurance, 7.02 group life insurance, 7.03 Voluntary Supplemental Insurance Offerings, 7.05 Employee Assistance Program. Okay, just to add a little bit to that, um, the 4.18 holidays adds Juneteenth as an additional recognized holiday uh, through the uh, year 2022. And then, uh, of course, once our, our uh, union negotiations occur, we'll have further discussion at that point. Um, Article 5.01 talks about the drug and alcohol free workplace plan. This is uh, an implement, this implements changes due to the recent South Dakota medical marijuana legislation. Article 7.01, group health and dental insurance, um, as well as the 702, which is group life insurance, and 703, voluntary supplemental insurance. These revisions clarify the definition of full time staff and eligibility for benefits. So 40 hour work week, 36 hour work week, um, just identifies that. And then article um, seven, section 705, employee assistance program. This revision adds that first responder assistance program as a new EAP program for us, um, which we talked about previously. Uh, reminder to me on that, the EAP program is new for you guys? It is not new. We've traditionally had EAP services. We do still have uh, family services here in Sioux Falls. This is just an additional um, uh, resource for us and okay. our staff. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions for Scott on any of these? We're going to uh, adopt all these in one fell swoop here. Uh, take a motion on them. Move to approve. Second. All right. Motion by Kylie. Seconded by Karski there. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Those are going to get adopted, and we'll move to item 10, uh, PSAP construction and procurement. Sure. Now that we've had groundbreaking and we're seeing some progress on the new public safety training campus site, um, it reminds us that the city of Sioux Falls and Minneapolis County adopted a joint public safety answering point agreement that establishes each entity's responsibility in the construction of a public safety answering point facility. Uh, Metro Communications has identified 
two significant equipment purchases that will need to be ordered in 2022 to secure our quoted pricing. Uh, the first being the Motorola radio system, the second being dispatch council furniture. I've created two charts. Uh, the first chart at the bottom identifies the furniture, fixtures, and equipment items to be purchased by Minneapolis County uh, with a total amount of 2,150,000. And then the second chart identifies FF&E items that will be purchased with state 911 funding. Um, as I mentioned, during calendar year 2022, uh, I'm, I'm seeking some type of authorization or approval to move forward on, on these projects, specifically Motorola, Motorola radio system and dispatch council furniture uh, in order to secure that, that pricing. All right. And this, uh, Sean Pritchett talked to me about some some perch we we're going to defer. Is that is that an upcoming item, or we were going to defer the, the receipts of the dollars from the county? For yes, a, yes, good point, uh, Mayor. That uh, although these will be ordered in 2022, the payment wouldn't be due until 2023, okay. which is coming up as a, another I, agenda item. Got it. Okay. Okay. So this is just authorization to procure the bids. Yes, and we'll follow all state bidding rules, uh, purchasing rules, and so forth. Okay. Scott, I thought we had a contract with Motorola to provide those. We do. Um, and like I said, I have to, I'd have to order that later this fall, or okay. excuse me, in fall So they're still under contract, basically. Motorola is under contract, um, okay. but at, at some point I'll tell them to go ahead with that, that okay. order. And then the furniture, uh, the dispatch council furniture, I've been in contact with uh, our pref preferred vendor. And uh, I'm being told that furniture shipping costs and so forth is rising Imagine that. pretty dramatically. Yeah. Um, so we're just trying to lock in that pricing. Um, we've had a couple different thoughts about how to do that. But at some point, I would have to order some, some of the items, if not all of the items, uh, with a payment due in 2023. All right. Thanks, Scott. Any other questions on that one, then? All right, take a motion on it. Move to approve. Second. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Benninga. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that one passes as well. Uh, item 11 is the revision of the joint public safety answering point agreement as a supplement to the joint cooperative agreement for communication services. Okay, in 2021, the city of Sioux Falls and Minneapolis County adopted the joint public safety answering point agreement and that's a supplement to the Joint Cooperative Agreement for Communication Services, which was ad adopted on December 20th, 2010, with an effective date of January 1st, 2011. <clears throat> Section five of the Joint Public Safety Answering Point Agreement obligates Minneapolis County to deposit into Metro Communications Agency account the sum of $2,150,000 on or before January 31st of 2022. The revised agreement changes that date of deposit from January 31st, 2022 to January 31st, 2023. And it's my understanding the rationale behind this is we don't need the money next year. Correct. So Carol's going to go make some interest on it for a Correct. year and then we'll get it. And move right. approval. Second. Okay. Motion <laughs> by uh, Karski, second by Benninga to approve this item. Uh, we will take a vote on Fix that. Fix in the mail. <laughs> yeah. All those, in all, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. That's, that passes. Item 12 uh, is the approval of the 2022 Minnehaha County Metro PSB lease agreement. Sure. Metro Communication leases 4,296 square foot of space from Minnehaha County within the public safety building. The lease the lease is renewed annually and runs from January 1st to December 31st. According to the 2021 lease agreement, the lease rate will increase at the Midwest Urban CPI Index 6.56%, which results in a 78 cent per square foot increase from 11.88 a square foot to 12.66 a square foot for a total of $54,400.77 and paid in 12 monthly installments of $4,533.40. All right. Any questions on that? Wasn't this part of the agreement we had with the construction of the facility and we were going to use this as a backup, so we'd already kind of agreed to this lease? 
there is a, a change for 2023 where that oh, okay. that language will gotcha. be changed. But for this year in 2022, it remains the same as the previous okay. lease. Is that a motion? Move for approval. Okay. Second. Kylie. All right. Motion by Benia, second by Kylie to approve this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That one passes. Uh, item 13 are uh, financial statements as of uh, November 30 of this year. Okay, I'm going to ask business manager Anna Raker to step up and uh, review those with you. Hey, Anna. Hi, good How afternoon. Are you? Good. How are you? Good. Good. So I know these numbers are pretty small. You all have packets, and for those of you here in attendance, there are packets if you, if this is too small for you to read. So you have in front of you your financials for the 11 months ending uh, November 30th, 2021. And uh, we'll start out with the balance sheet. Um, one of the things that's uh, going to jump out at you with the balance sheet is that um, our cash has improved substantially from a year ago. The balance sheet looks at the same period um, in the prior year. And really that increase is due um, in great part to the fact that when we budgeted for 2021, we budgeted to add to reserves rather than use reserves, which had been our, our focus in prior years. And then the other thing you have going on is a year ago, um, we were um, we had a delayed receipt of 911 surcharge revenue. I don't know if you remember that, but they were just a little slow in getting those revenues out, and that's over $200,000. Um, so the combination of all of that explains why our cash is a little higher this year. It's, it's, it makes sense. It's, there's nothing unusual about it. Um, the other thing I will point out is um, uh, the due from state and the due from county. We've exceeded our estimated um, uh, receivables that we put together at the end of last year um, in our um, audit report and so we're doing well there um, just uh, scrolling down a little bit hold on here I'm gonna get to a different sheet myself um, accounts receivable has decreased and that's really just due to the timing of billing um, and um, accounts payable has increased. And that really, again, is just um, timing of billing or timing of payments. In 2020, I paid the um, retirement at the end of November versus waiting until after the first of the month. It was just the way things worked out with my schedule. So um, the other thing is our payroll deductions payable will change a little bit. It has to do with our flex benefit provider and how we manage those funds. So you see um, a small increase um, when you're looking at um, accounts payable. One of the things Scott and I talked about earlier today is our vacation liability um, line item um, decreased as, um, at the end of 2020 and really Part of that is staffing, but, but the other part of it, I think, is a credit to our management team and the work we've put into with <coughs> temp staff and um, just staffing to ensure that staff can get time off when they need it. And that's reflected in our year-end balance sheet with our accrued liabilities. And so when vacation goes down, that's, that's just an indication of, of that, which is, which is a positive um, move towards work-life balance for our team. Moving on to the next page is our current versus prior year actual. And this is in a summary form. And so what we're looking at here is um, major categories and we're looking at um, January through November in the current year and January through November in 2020. And you'll notice there the difference in surcharge revenues, and that's what we talked about earlier, is that a year ago we just, they were delayed and they didn't get our November, our ch November check arrived at the same, around the same time as our December check. City and county support shows a budgeted increase, um, which we knew, and that reflects that. 
Um, the services increase really is in great part to EMS transfers. Um, we had a rate increase, plus our numbers are a little stronger this year as compared to last year. And last year, if you recall, we had a little bit of a decline, and it was around the time COVID occurred. I'm not sure how to really relate that, but people were maybe going out less, less activity. Grants, when you're looking at grants, um, this includes local funding streams. And Scott has mentioned to you before how hard we've worked in the last couple years to secure other funding opportunities. And so um, you do see that um, increase um, that from, from last year to this year. The other thing I'll mention, Scott, Scott talked about the Work Surface Pros and we just secured some more grant funds this late this fall. So you're gonna see that number increase by the time you see your December report when we meet again um, in the spring. So we've done a great job of trying to utilize those resources to alleviate pressure on the city and the county and Metro's cash flow. Our other revenue decrease is really, a lot of that is interest. You know, not knowing when we budgeted where um, the co that the um, pandemic was going to happen and what was going to happen with the economy. Moving on to expenditures, um, personnel. Uh, personnel increased about $50,000. It's really reflective of COLA and STEP increases. We still continue to maximize temp, temp staff to cover vacancies and provide for work-life balance for our full-time staff whenever possible. Um, in the, in the devil in the details behind this is our overtime is lower again this year than a prior year, and we did the same thing last year. We, we've been working at trying to reduce overtime as much as possible, right? Um, and then the <coughs> other thing is um, group health insurance is fairly flat from 2020 to 2021. We fared very, very well in our quotes and the plans that we secured. Um, for our team, and we have a strong participation in our group health insurance plan. It's it's a good 75% of staff, so um, it's well used by our, our team. Operating expenses, there's just a couple things that jump out. Professional services decreased. Some of this is due to year-end bills, but it's also due to, we had some unusual expenses in 2020 related to kind of some staff development type um, things. Uh, repairs is simply just the timing of the public safety um, invoicing for Metro share of that. Um, they billed us in December last year and November this year, and so we paid it timely, and that's why it shows differently. And that's a significant bill. Supplies are a little more this year. Oops. And supplies are... Um, include several of the grant funded purchases that Scott has talked to you about. So they, they're a little high this year, they'll probably go down next year uh, until we get to the point where we're starting to purchase items for the new facility. Utilities are fairly stable um, and um, there was just some small miscellaneous uh, decrease due to COVID related expenditures. So meaning we had some more expenditures in 2020 that we didn't have this year when we had to implement some things just to keep sa staff separate. Moving on to our budget report, and then this one is um, the comparison of year to date budget, year to date expenditures and the variance in dollars and then we look at the percentage of our annual budget. So there's two um, items that you see in this particular um, purview. Um, November of 2000, um, November would be 92% or, uh, excuse me, yes, November would be 92% of the year for just normal revenues and expenditures, but remember that 911 surcharges are always two months behind because there's a 45 day delay so really they should be around 75%. I'm projecting that our 911 revenues are gonna be very, very close to our budget, give or take maybe $5,000 right now. Um, I don't have any control over what's gonna happen over the next three months, but right now it, we, we seem to be on track and there hasn't been anything out of the ordinary, so that's looking pretty good. I think we'd all love to see them go way up um, but we know that they've been, we've been increasing our subscriber lines, um, but statewide the numbers still remain fairly flat. And so 
we seem to be getting a bigger piece of the subscribers because of our population growing. But when we look at the incentive dollars, remember those are still a single pot of money. And, um, and so if the state wide numbers are kind of going down a little and ours are going up, they're remaining flat. And so we're not seeing the growth in that particular pot of funds. Those are staying pretty stable. Um, when we look at our budget, um, all of our PSAP um, billing has been submitted and received. Um, audio fees have increased a little bit this year. That's a very volatile number. It can change from year to year, but um, we've had a great year for audios. And then um, Paramedics Plus, both the rates and the numbers of transfers have increased. And we have two months remaining there because we can't bill until after the first of the month. Other revenue is um, the decrease is largely due to interest income. And then we haven't had as many PD saturation reimbursements. But that means we haven't had the expenses because we only request reimbursement for what we actually um, incur over and above our normal salaries in order to support that, the law enforcement team for those saturations. Personnel. Um, when you look at personnel, we're doing very well. Um, we do have some vacancies right now. Um, I am estimating that um, our salaries are going to be a couple hundred thousand under budget right now. Um, our overtime is going to be a little over budget um, based on our current projections. Um, along with that, taxes and retirement will drop. Our temp are very close to budgeted amount based on my projections. Um, group health, again, um, I think we're going to be around 70000 under budget, and that's really doing in um, great strides to how well we did on our rates. And I'll just take the opportunity to let you know that for 2022, our rates fared very, very well. Again, we have um, under a 4%, and actually the effective rate is closer to under 3% increase. So we, we should be very happy with how well we did um, and what that will do to help us in our personnel budget items, okay? Um, when you look at expenditures, uh, maintenance contracts, um, we talked about that, that we were billed in November this year instead of December, and so um, that shows there. The scrolling down to dispatch communications and um, the amount there, um, our SIP lines ended up being a little more expensive than what we originally anticipated they would be, and we've talked about this earlier this year. Um, but as we get to the end of the year, that increase is becoming more and more obvious. So just a reminder that we, we knew that once we got in, our original estimate was, was a little lower than what they actually ended up being. What is that expense for specifically? I'll let Scott talk to you about that. Sure, the SIP lines helped us to build a better redundancy into our backup center uh, by having the standard internet protocol uh, ability at that uh, backup center, we can now add additional phones. Otherwise, we were limited to the six positions we had down there, but um, by having this avail availability, um, we're able to establish more phone, um, uh, soft phones through a, a laptop computer. Um, you know, we are, we, set up are we talking about dispatch communications? Yes. Okay. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Any follow-up? You good? I, I might ask questions privately. I'm just trying to understand it, but yeah. So we kind of were anticipating it might get to where it is, but yeah. yeah. Okay. At the time we budgeted, we had an estimate for that cost to implement that, and then once we started implementing it, we realized that we had underestimated, we had under-budgeted. And so we, earlier in the year, when we only meet a few times a year, it wasn't quite as obvious, but, but we knew that by the time we got to 12 months at that rate, it was gonna be a little more significant. I think we budgeted 800 and some dollars per month for those SIP lines, and what we're paying is over 1400. So you take that over the course of a year, and it, it adds up. And, and that's not maybe a, a significant of an increase in your size of budget, but for Metro's budget, when our total operating expenditures are where they are, it, every little bit is obvious. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, the other thing, and I don't know if you want to address this, Scott, but Scott and I talked this morning, and he reminded me that we just found out earlier this week 
that the um, public safety software has agreed to a zero dollar increase for 2022. And that's a nice thing for all of us. And Metro's share of that cost is over $60,000. And that's the bill I mentioned that um, you see the adjustment from last year to this year because we had been paying it in December and we paid it in November this year. But um, you know, the share for your departments is obviously much greater than Metro's. So it's a, it's a significant item for all of us. Okay, other other questions uh, on the financials for Anna? All right. Uh, looks like there's an amendment though that we need to consider on the budget. Is that correct? Yes. And I would you um, accept a motion to accept the? Oh yes. I'm sorry. That's I need, okay. I need so a motion moved. to accept the financials. So moved. moved. Second. All right. Motion by Karski, seconded by Kylie. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, those are accepted. Item 14 then is uh, approval of a 2021 budget amendment. Right, so we're requesting a budget amendment and the reason for this amendment relates back to the funding um, streams that Scott is in our team have been able to secure. And some of these items we've been able to absorb within our budgets just due to savings in other areas. Um, but my request uh, for the amendment would be that um, you make a motion to amend our budget to increase operating expenditures in the amount of 15,000, capital outlay in the amount of 7,000, funded by increased revenues in the amount of 22,000. Okay. Move approval. Second. All right, motion by Karski, seconded by Kylie to uh, adopt this amendment as presented. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that is going to pass. Uh, item 15, exec session. Uh, I don't believe we have uh, any exec session. We do have a need needs. for an executive session. We do. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, then um, move us into exec session. I, need a <coughs> I always forget how to do this. So I need a motion to move us into exec session. Anna, is that how it works? Mm -hmm. Okay. So moved, Benninga. Second. All right, motion by Benninga, second by Karski to move us in the exec session. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, all right, we'll, uh, we'll break out, jump into the side room, and then we'll be back in here when we call us out.